Mr. President, fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests. All around the globe, there are people standing up, like I'm doing just now, to talk about Scotland's national poet. The trouble is, I have been to quite a number of burn suppers where the person doing this role has chosen to deliver what I would describe as fairly dull repetition, repetitious uh, speeches full of well-worn platitudes. They include facts about the life of the bard and it's peppered with occasional things such as quotations, verses, perhaps a little bit of uh, song as well, almost as an afterthought. I suppose that's why another great Scottish poet, Hewitt Bermett, wrote in his long, long, long diatribe about all things Scottish called A Drunk Man Looks at a Thistle. <laughs> Mere nonsense has been uttered in his name that only is other, uh, other than liberty and Christ. Small wonder that when I've been asked to propose this toast to the immortal memory, it's always struck me as something of a challenge how to avoid these traps, using my Toastmaster skills, of course. But as in the way of Toastmasters, just remember, this is my personal evaluation. I've often wondered why, when Scotland has many other poets, writers, heroes, that we don't treat them with quite the same veneration. Why should it also be, as you yourself suggested in uh, your introduction tonight, that so many other nations celebrate Burns. After all, the English have Shakespeare, the Irish have Joyce, the Italians Dante, and every one of them is thoroughly well known internationally, but there's no Shakespeare's supper, there's no Joyce junket, there's no Dante dinner. <laughs> Only Burns is celebrated in this unique way, and it is truly an international affair. A chain of fellowship follows the setting sun westward, from Scotland to the Americas, across to Asia and Australasia, to India, the Middle East and Africa, before coming back to Europe, right around the world, right around the clock. At this time of year, for many days before and after the 25th his day, there's hardly an hour of the day when a burn supper is not taking place somewhere on this earth. So why should that be? You might say it has something to do with the quality of Burns' poetry. You could say it is his universal appeal to the common man and woman. You could say that it also lies in the simple themes and simple words that he used on love, on life on liberty. Against that, others would actually claim that Burns is more praised than necessarily read. Afterward, after all, he wrote something like 550 songs and poems in his relatively short life. They add, perhaps a little cynically, that most Burns gatherings are for the sole purpose of enjoying fairly large quantities of food and drink a little bit like some of the festive things that we've just experienced at the end of last month. However, every year at this time, people gather, as we have tonight, to rejoice in the heritage that's been passed down to us and to toast the memory of a man who's been dead for almost 230 years. We may be at this burn supper, but how much do we individually know of the man? Some of us will admit to knowing something general, but little specific about Burns. Many of us here will know something about his life and work. Those of us who were born in Scotland, at least, many of us will actually have studied his poetry. But how much of that, from the days of school, do we actually remember? How much do we know of the ploughman poet from Ayrshire. When I was at school, I do remember having to learn some of his poems. Some of them we may hear tonight. There was To a Mouse, To a Louse. My love is like a red, red rose, which I think Mark is going to perform for you later. 
I even learned Tam O'Shanter, which those of you who were at this dinner last year may remember I actually managed to remember. <laughs> I was also encouraged to read around the subject of Robert Burns, but that was a long time ago. And what it really means is that all I can really lay claim to is that most dangerous of things, a little knowledge. I didn't know until preparing this uh, that actually Burns' father came from the northeast of Scotland. His name was William, and when he was up there, his name was actually Burness rather than Burns. It changed somewhere when he came south. He was a farm labourer, and he first came to Edinburgh, where he helped drain what was then known as the Nor Loch, which was where Prince's Gar uh, Prince Street Gardens now stands. And after that work had finished, he moved west and settled in Ayrshire. Burns Senior lived through the first, uh, first through the agricultural revolution and then through the start of the Scottish Enlightenment. And like a lot of parents in those days, he believed in education. So when young Robert was six, he and other parents gathered together to found a school and they actually employed a teacher. Though that teacher, he was known as a domini in Scots, only lasted about three years. After that, it was up to the parents themselves to, the, to continue the education. I think you'll agree that, as far as Robert was concerned, they actually did a fairly good job. However, the whole family was much less successful at farming. It pretty well killed old father William, so to speak. Robert's efforts with his brother Gilbert were equally doomed to failure, so it was probably a really good thing that Robert had a good way with words. By the way, he was never known as Rabbi. He was known as Rab, he was known as Robin, but never Rabbi. So, let me ask you, when you think of Burns, what comes to mind? His poetry and songs? His love of women? Children, both in and out of wedlock? His revolutionary spirit, his nationalism, his storytelling? his love of whiskey. Do we really, however, know the man? Let's take the last of these first, because it's the one that's actually done most damage to his reputation. The rot set in early on, thanks to a man called Dr. James Curry. Dr. Curry was chosen to edit Burns' works after his death, but he was singularly ill-equipped for the job. And as a young man, Curry had been something, shall we say, a little bit fond of a wee libation himself. By the time he was given the task of editing Burns' work, uh, his works, he'd become respectable. But when he looked at the stories surrounding Burns and indeed some of the poetry that he'd written, he decided that he must have been a poetic rake who indulged quite heavily in all too many drunken routes. And what he did with that guesswork on his part was, in many respects, unforgivable. He condemned Burns' fondness for a dram and started what was to become accepted fact for more than a century, that Burns was a confirmed alcoholic. He also took considerable liberties with the documents that he had to hand in order to reinforce his prejudice. Others tried to set the record straight. Take a man called Alexander Findlater, for example. He was Burns' superior officer in the excise. About 20 years after the poet's death, he wrote, it's much regretted that Dr. Curry's Life of Burns has become the textbook for succeeding commentators who have, by aid of their own fancies, amplified, exaggerated, and filled up the outlines he sketched. He then went on to try to dispel a number of myths surrounding Burns, particularly that one about him being such a prodigious drinker. He would never have been able to hold down that job as an exciseman if he'd been constantly drunk. But by then, it was too late. When it comes to women, however, that was a different matter. Robert was one of the founding members of the Tar Bolton Bachelors Club, 
It was founded as a diversion to relieve the wearied man worn down by the necessary labours of life. <laughs> exactly. Robert was its first president and the first meeting drew up the rules for membership, which included every man proper for a member of this society must have a frank, honest, open heart above anything dirty or mean and must be a professed lover of one or more of the female sex. <laughs> no doubt about that one then. But some of his finest poetry would almost certainly never have been written if it hadn't been for his love of, for women. For instance, early on, he wrote this about the six bells of Mochlin. Miss Miller is fine, Miss Markland's divine. Miss Miller, she has wit, and Miss Betty is bra. There's beauty and fortune to get with Miss Morton, but armour's the jewel for me of them all. Okay, <laughs> you've got to admit that's not his finest verse. <laughs> but at least proves that Burns was enthusiastic in his pursuit of the fairer sex. And in those days, as we know, children were an inevitable consequence. We know that Burns fathered many of them, 12 that we know of. His first child was called, uh, was born in 1785 to a family servant called Betty Payton. That was the same year that he met Jean Armour, mentioned in the last line of that verse as the jewel. He had with Jean an intense intimate affair for which he was censured by the Kirk and had to spend some time on what was known as the cutty stool in front of the in, in, excuse me, in, in front of the congregation denounced as a fornicator but there can be no doubt about his feelings for her when you hear, oh, all the airts the wind can blow, I dearly love the West, for there the bonny lassie lives, the lass I love the best. There's wild woods grow and rivers row, and money a hill between, but day and night my fancy's flight is ever wi' my Jean. Jean Armour must have been an incredibly patient and very understanding woman. She had no fewer than nine children with Robert, four of them before they were married, a heinous sin in those days. Sadly, only three of them survived infancy. At the same time, he had children by three other women. In fact, Jean actually looked after some of them. However, she is the only one of Burns' loves to be honoured with a statue in their home village of Mochlin. It's clear that Burns must also have had considerable respect for women, especially when you hear his poem, The Rights of Women, which we'll hear later from Penny. In this poem, he suggests that the ruling classes of the day would benefit from turning their attention to the female sex to generate humanity rather than crippling civilization with war. It was even suggested that this was perhaps a revolutionary, even seditious poem, and all because of its final verse. But truce with kings and truce with constitutions, with bloody armaments and revolutions, let majesty your first attention summon, a saira, the majesty of women. It's that brief exclamatory phrase, a saira, it's the title of a French revolutionary song, and some people have interpreted that as implying Burns' support for the French Revolution. You could say it was the Charlie Hebdo of his day. So was Burns a revolutionary? If ever there was a man who hated tyranny or oppression of any kind, that man was Robert Burns. This was the man who wrote, while we sing God save the king, will they forget the people? He was also the man who penned that homage to the common man, a man's a man for all that, which concludes with the lines, then let us pray that come it may, and come it will for all that, that sense and worth or all the earth shall bear the gree and all that. For all that and all that it's coming yet for all that, that man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for all that. Some of you may possibly remember the impact that the singer Sheena uh, Wellington had when she sang that unaccompanied in the opening day of the Scottish Parliament in 1999.
the politicians joined in and gave her a well-deserved round of applause. But you wonder what the royal party thought of it at the time, especially when it included lines such as, you see that Burkey called a lord who struts and stares and all that. Though thousands worship at his word, he's but a coof for all that. If you're wondering what a Burkey and a coof are, they're basically just plain common insults. <laughs> Burns is also a man who courted some danger when he wrote about independence, both for France and indeed for America. The United Kingdom was soon to be at war with both and revolutionary ideas were seriously frowned on. Once at a banquet, Burns was asked to drink the health of the Prime Minister, Pitt, and he replied, I'll give you a better toast, George Washington. And when he heard about the first American Congress in 1776, he wrote that the 4th of July would be as famous to their posterity as the 5th of November, Guy Fawkes Day for us. It's been suggested, and indeed some quarters it's taken as gospel, that Burns was a Scottish nationalist. Indeed, his words have been harnessed to various causes and interpreted to suit people's purposes. But if we look at least at one of his poet poems, The Parcel of Rogues, we can see that he did actually have a nationalistic bent. It runs, think of the opening lines, Fair wheel to all our Scottish fame, fair wheel our ancient glory, fair wheel into the Scottish name, say famed in martial story. What he's doing there is attacking the moneyed classes of Scotland for selling out to the English in the Act of Union of 1707. And he looks back in contrast to the War of Independence. The English steel we could disdain, secure in valour station, but English gold has been our bane such a parcel of rogues in a nation. Let's move on to Burns the storyteller, lighten it a wee bit. Think of the Cotter Saturday night, or in fact, Tam O'Shanter. Sadly, that is not going to be delivered this evening. What he does with both of them is he paints word pictures. Listen to these lines from Tam O'Shanter describing the cosy seat in a warm bar with good friends on a stormy night. The night drive on with sangs and clatter, and I, the ale, was getting better. The landlady and Tam grew gracious with favours sweet and secret, sweet and precious. The suitor told his queerest stories. The landlord's laugh was ready chorus. The storm outside might rear and rustle. Tam didna mind the storm a whistle. You can always picture yourself, can't you? Alongside him and his merry crew in that Ayrshire bar, the storm gathering strength outside, and of course, he has to ride home through it, where he sees the witch's Sabbath, and indeed the deal himself at Kirk Alloway. You can also find him sitting, uh, you can sit beside him in a church um, on the day that he saw a particularly audacious louse climbing up a lady's bonnet, a local beauty whom we only know now of as Jenny. Ha! What are you going, you cowling fearly? Your impudence protects you sairly. I canna say, but you trust rarely your gauze, gauze and glaze. Though faith, I fear you dine but sparely on sicker place. It's not a terribly long poem, but I'll jump straight to the end because it has given us, at least in Scots, one of the great quotations of all time. O oh, would some power the gifty gee us to see ourselves as others see us. Burns sent quite a lot of time here in Edinburgh, and it was here that he met a lady by the way of Nancy McElhose. There was an immediate attraction, but it was a fair, an affair of the heart, not the head. Of the head, perhaps, rather than the heart, is the way I should do. It, it was an affair that was never consummated, but their letters and poems to each other really show the depth of feeling. In these, they adopted pseudonyms of Clarinda and Sylvander, Nancy had been separated from her husband for seven years, and in one short poem to Byrne, she tells of her unhappy marriage, while at the same time explaining why they could never be more than just friends. Talk not of love, it gives me pain, for love has been my foe. He bound me with an iron chain and plunged me deep in woe. Your friendship much can make me blessed, but why this bliss destroy? 
why the odious one request you know I must deny. A few days later, Burns replied with one of his sweetest poems. A fond kiss, and then we sever. A farewell, alas, forever. Deep in heart-wrung tears I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. We'll hear the four full poem from Mel shortly. Burns had a mixed relationship with some of the, shall we say, the middle classes here in Edinburgh. For example, some of them were rather snobbish about his peasant background. Take this example from the Edinburgh Magazine in 1786. It read, Who are you, Mr. Burns? At what university were you educated? What authors have you studied? Who has praised your poems and under whose patronage are they published? In short, what qualifications entitle you to entertain us? The writer was James Sybil, the magazine's editor, but thankfully his was a minority view. His comments were written in the year that Burns published his first slim volume of verse, which he now called the Kilmarnock edition. He'd been invited by an admirer, Dougal Stewart, professor of moral philosophy at Edinburgh University not just to the come to the capital, but actually to produce a larger edition of his works. And while here, one of the first parties he was invited to included some of the leading lights of the Scottish establishment, or even the Scottish Enlightenment. You had Adam Smith, the economist. You had James Hutton, the grandfather of modern geology. You had James Black, the chemist, Joseph Black, the chemist, who discovered carbon dioxide. It also included a shy 15-year-old boy known to the company as Young Watty, but we have come to know him as Sir Walter Scott. Forty years later, Scott told his biographer that he remembered that day as though it were yesterday. What he remembered most were the poet's eyes. This Scott was a man who was a friend of kings and princes, of politicians, and the leading literary and academic figures of his day. And yet he had never seen anything like the flashing, black, large eyes of Robert Burns. If a man like Scott fell under his spell, what hope was there for the ladies, you might say? <laughs> but it was Scott, at least to my mind, who wrote the best epitaph to Burns. It was written shortly after he heard of the poet's death. He wrote, Long life to thy fame and peace to thy soul, Rab Burns. When I want to express any sentiment which I feel strongly, I find the phrase in Shakespeare or in thee. With that moving tribute, can I ask you to be upstanding and drink a toast to the immortal memory of Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Robert Burns.